Welcome back to Story Dive, everybody. I'm here with my wonderful partner, Kai. How's it going, Kai? Pretty good. Pretty good. I heard you found um, some, uh, some mango apple juice. Yes, I I just found the juice that my wife made last night, and I, oh, it's good. Mango it's, peach apple. It's homemade? Well, it's homemade from a frozen oh, I see. <laughs> like thingy that you stick into water. I, I let, let's let's just say it was it was made by the you know by hand by like actual. She grew it yes. from the tree from the vine. Yeah, imported from Madagascar. Uh, yeah. Yep. What a story. Um, see, we can make a story of anything, even frozen juice. Yeah. But I have an important question for you. Do okay. you do you think Wait, have you introduced yourself yet? Who are you? Oh, um I'm you know, I'm that guy that has doubloons. You know, you can call me uh, Mr. Doobie. <laughs> so uh... I don't know if we want to call you that. <laughs> <laughs> or or you can call me Logan. Um, that takes a whole new meaning entirely. I also go by Logan, so you can call me that uh if you want. Yeah. You know. Uh but anyways anyways uh bad yeah, you had a question for me and it was yeah important. uh do you think that there are legendary artifacts or weapons in real life do you think they exist so for reference you're talking like excalibur yes stuff something like that do you think they're real you know like the, uh, the, fountain, the fountain of youth or the holy grail well, or you know whatever right the infinity stones i don't necessarily believe the infinity stones are real <laughs> um that'd be kind of scary if they were and if they were real then that means everything else of marvel was real which would be kind of scary because we'd be facing world ending events yeah. every other day i mean it would be but it would also mean that like wakanda's real so like let's just go to wakanda you know what i'm saying that's fair that's fair <laughs> uh i mean hey they got flooded or whatever happened to them and the oh, we, we don't have to talk be. about that you know but they, they've got the tech you know we could just no that's true it's true go get some, some well so tech. <laughs> i definitely think those items I, I have no evidence to suggest they don't exist but i also don't know if they exist in the way that we think they do like maybe excalibur really was a sword mm. but i don't necessarily believe it was a a magic sword or or something like maybe these items or locations the fountain of youth were are, are legendary because they've been kind of exaggerated to be so if that makes sense yeah yeah i do think because i i was wondering about that like a lot of because okay so this the topic for today uh, if you haven't guessed it already we're gonna be talking about like ancient legendary items and artifacts uh in stories and uh it is interesting how a lot of them like like so okay so real quick like i know you, you we already mentioned some but are there any other legendary items and artifacts in storytelling that like come to your mind come to my mind yeah that, like off the top of your head like what do you think of when you think of like legendary items uh i immediately think of uh the heart of atlantis Mm. In Venoblade, they have the Monado. Right. That's yes. a pretty legendary item. But I, I'm trying to think of things that aren't just weapons. Yeah, a lot of them are weapons, actually. Uh, especially in like a lot of fiction that has been created uh, over the years. Yeah, anything else? Hey, you, uh, you didn't mention Mithril, Excalibur. Is it Mithril? The, the elven armor in Lord of the Rings? It's like. Super light chainmail. Yes, I do it's think it's in, invincible. It is made out of mithril, I think, in Lord of the Rings. Which is mithril is a real is mithril a real ore in real life? I don't know. Let me, let me look that <laughs> I, up. I, I've always been under the impression mithril's been real. Mithril is a fictional metal. Oh, fetch. Okay, well, I think I don't know if Tolkien probably uh, popularized it for sure. Um. But I don't know who originated it because I feel like a lot of fiction tends to take these like fake ores and metals and like adopt them into their own world, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. So interesting. Well, so interesting. it seems like Mithril is based on titanium, but it's it's not okay. Real. 
it's not real titanium it would be like if titanium was like as light as a feather it's it essentially i can't believe it's not titanium it's what myth really is. and it looks cool because it's like that like tealish like silvery blue you know yeah yeah um okay well because i think it's interesting uh I, I was just i was interested in like maybe discussing a little bit of if you think that they come from like history because things like excalibur uh like the holy grail and um like the fountain of youth things like that are like i don't think those were created through fictional stories i think they were kind of like myth first um like things that actually existed that maybe got spiraled into like some myth about this thing that's actually real you know um but it, it could they could have also just been fictional i just think it's interesting where the idea of a legendary item does go like super far back in like you know throughout humanity it's not like a new idea necessarily um yeah but i do think that in recent years the idea of a legendary item has been way more common like way way more common in in, in especially in like rpgs like jrpgs like totally love this idea but i really want to ask um about like what their role is in stories like if if a story has a legendary item like what does that do to the story is it a good thing is it a bad thing what does it add what is it does it detract from the story um so yeah uh do you have any thoughts on that off the bat i think when you give someone a legendary item i can think of some good ones and some bad ones recently because mm, it, it's kind of a polarizing experience if you give someone a legendary item it's kind of like giving someone superpowers they can either mm. like at least in the realms of storytelling yes it can give someone an engine for character growth yes it's like like a iron man suit Yes. I, I guess you could kind of consider it a legendary item. It's not like based on myth or anything, but it it's a suit of armor. It essentially gives them superpowers. A legendary-esque item. But it is used to fuel his character development. He becomes a suit. He becomes obsessed with the suit. And then a lot of his story thereafter is him trying to be the right mix between the suit and Tony Stark. Yeah. Uh, another example would be Excalibur is a great item, legendary item, for what it represents. Because uh, in lots of fiction, I don't think the original Excalibur had magic powers. I, and, I don't, yeah. Maybe I, it does nowadays. I think it was just a sword that was stuck in a stone. Right. Actually, I don't even think, if my memory serves me correctly, Excalibur isn't the sword in the stone. Those are two different swords. Really? The original Excalibur was given to King Arthur by the Lady of the Lake. And the Sword and the Stone is just something else. But they've kind of been oh, mixed together. Yeah, okay. Over time. Um, but Excalibur, or I guess in this case, the Sword and the Stone, whatever you want to call it, uh, represents so much more. Because it is a legendary item, but it's it's like... It represents the the ability to rule Camelot. The yeah. person that draws the sword from the stone rules Camelot. So there's so much importance placed on this item, but it's more the mantle that the item carries, not necessarily the item itself. Yeah. So I was, here are some of the questions I, I wanted to bring up because that's it's a really good point. I think there's a big, and I love that you mentioned superpowers, by the way, because one of the the things i've written down here is i i was i was thinking about it when i was uh, preparing for this episode and i was like what other forms can a legendary item take cuz normally we the first thing you think of is a weapon cuz that's just the most common thing these days and then the second thing you would think of is probably some kind of ancient artifact or relic something that like indiana jones would go and find or something something in a pyramid somewhere that's going to like 
you know, whatever, like even like stuff like uh, the genie's lamp from Aladdin, right? Like something you have to go and find that'll like change your life or give you whatever, or give you like a wish or whatever. Um, but then I do think that it's interesting how I, I, I did write down here that superpowers is in a way the same as getting a legendary item. So gained superpowers I have on here as well as well as uh this fourth one which I think is super interesting we're going to get into that later um but I do think it's super cool that you brought that up because I absolutely agree that something like Iron Man uh or even like Peter Parker getting bitten by the spider that that in in a way it's almost like uh I think it serves the same role in a story as like getting a weapon that would be super useful you know what I mean like they, they kind of serve case, a similar purpose are we considering the spider that bites Peter a legendary item? Well, so, so this that this is what I wanted to talk about because I'm I I did want to kind of have a discussion about like what's the difference, right? And I, I so before we before we talk about that, I did want to mention that uh it, I think there is a stark difference between items that you have to work for and be worthy of, and items that are kind of just there. Does that make sense? Because I, I feel yes. like, and I don't know if I don't know if we can think of any good examples on the the ones that are just there, but there there are instances and in stories where it's like, uh, like someone has to be worthy of this item to get it, and then the other one is like whoever gets to it first gets the power. You know what I mean? And it's kind of like this race. Oh, gotcha. You know what I mean? Uh, so it's like the villain could get it, or you know, because I I am thinking about Aladdin actually, uh, because. I feel like anybody who gets in there and gets the lamp gets the genie, right? You don't have to be sure. worthy, right? Like, you know, Jafar ends up getting the lamp later and it goes terribly because it, he, it doesn't matter who gets it. It just, matter, it, it just matters if you get it. Whereas with Excalibur... Goatee gets much more evil. Uh, it's my understanding that with Excalibur, like, only Arthur was able to get it. Like, I, was anyone else able to get it? Has anyone else had Excalibur? No. Maybe for the sake of the argument, I'm just going to call it the Excalibur. Uh, I don't really know. I don't think anyone else wielded Excalibur. Definitely modern in modern ages. Uh, it's like only King Arthur can wield the sword. Yes. And yeah, and uh, with Iron Man, I feel like it's a very similar thing where you know it, it's not like the item was there and he had to like work for it but he did in a way have to become worthy and work to make that happen like through his own hard work is how he earned his ability um and only he could do it so i feel like it is similar in a storytelling way um like which is interesting to me whereas something like maybe the dragon balls from dragon ball z would be on the other side where it's like you just have to get all of the Dragon Balls and you can make a wish and do anything, right? So I'm like... Doesn't Goku have to use that to, like, bring himself back to life almost every time? <laughs> well, he can't do it to bring himself back to life because if he's, he's dead. So his friends do it, usually. Um, <laughs> so they, but... just, they go on this adventure <laughs> over and over again to bring back the guy who's, like, on a death spiral. Yeah, well, I mean, spoilers for Dragon Ball Z... Uh, I mean, at this point, it's kind of hard to not know that. But there is there is a por point in the series where they try to revive Goku, and Goku's like, nah, "I'm good. I'm gonna stay dead." And they're like, "What?" So that's funny. But um, anyways, but you know what I mean? Like, oh, I I'm trying to figure out here. Like, th there there's so many different ways to take these items, and like, which way I think provides like the more the the deeper story and the more interesting thing because do you think it it's limiting when only one person like uh this person is the only person who can use this legendary item or do you think it's more interesting when anybody can use it i guess it matters in this case what the story is for or who's in the story so i guess in this case legendary items are built to serve characters. Okay. Um, so, as an example, Thor's hammer, Mjolnir. Yes. 
uh, that mm-hmm. I can think of. Only he can wield the hammer, right? Yes. Until suddenly so, some other character can wield the hammer. Uh, the first instance we really see of that is Vision. Yes. Uh, wielding the hammer in, in Age of Ultron. Yes. That's a case where that's the only way that he was really able to, at least in uh, any consequential amount of time, convince the Avengers that he was worthy, that he could, he was of helping. He could help. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like it so didn't serve a... in that way, yeah. the rules around who can wield it or not is really specific and it can be used for story beats because the audience knew as soon as vision holds up the hammer to to uh thor even the audience were like okay he's a good guy yeah yeah i can like, trust that i i actually love uh how the mcu handled mjolnir like i love the fact that like it really is thor's it's thor's thing right and so it, it's like only he, he can use it but then they also start allowing these other characters to kind of be able to use it. And I don't know. I do love that where it's not, it's not like a set rule where only Thor can use it. Um, and they, they kind of have fun with it. And I, I know, I know, I know exactly what you're saying where I, even in, in end game, when cap starts using it, it's like, and he's like, I, I knew who all the log or whatever. You, uh, like th- th- what that does to the, the watcher, like it, you instantly know, right. What that means because like they've built up this whole reputation around it and the meaning behind it. Like if someone else was able to use Excalibur, uh, it would have that, th- th- or even in Zelda, like uh, Master Sword, right? Which th- that might go into my next point where I do think that something, you know, and like Zelda is not necessarily a narrative focused series. Uh, they do have a lot of plot elements and a lot of cool lore things but i think the master sword is also one of the most iconic legendary items but i do think it's interesting how link is the only one to ever use it but i i don't feel like they ever establish that he's the only person who can use it Um, right but yet he's the only person who ever does like if it it, it, yeah like think about it in the in the same way about thor like if if link dropped the sword because he's done that before it's gotten knocked out of his hand before it's been uh it's not like if it if it's out of his hand it disappears or something uh maybe in like breath of the wild because it's in breath of the wild and tears of the kingdom it's a little weird the way they do it but um yeah like if he drops it and someone goes to pick it up like can they use it is that a thing it's a good Um, question is it too heavy does it burn them does it like warp back to him it's just it's like going back to me and here like the Hulk tries to lift the Mjolnir in the first Avengers. Yes. And he can't. Yeah. So it, like that, like that's the story element that that adds is like awesome. It's a really interesting thing where it's like not even like the strongest creature alive can lift this thing up. And yet he could like probably uh, lift a mountain. I so. guess in this case, it's important to establish the rules of the item, especially if it's a weapon or something. Yes. What? Like, if you establish those rules, it can be really helpful for the characters when something does happen. The audience is able to be like, wow, that's that's not following the rules, but it kind of is. Mm-hmm. But you don't just want to break the rule for the sake of breaking it. You want to do it in an understandable way. So, like, when, when Cap does finally lift me and ear, we, the audience have already seen some evidence of it. And we also have seen Cap to be a very honorable, worthy leader kind of person. Yes. So and, yeah. when when he finally does get me in here, it's a very believable experience, which is why we cheer so hard. It's because we, mm-hmm. we want that to happen. It would well, it would mean something so different if instead of the hammer going to to Steve, it went to Tony. Like yes. that would have, I don't think that would have worked. Yes, I agree. Cause uh, another thing is, uh, you know, Tony has his own character arc throughout the end game, uh, like story, like whatever you want to call that whole deal from, from start to finish. But he had his old character arc, but it didn't seem to be as kind of like Rocky as uh, Steve Rogers. Sorry. I wanted to say Chris Evans and I was like, that's not his name. 
Um, but Steve Roger, he starts out as like a pure soul and then kind of goes through like kind of this like dark period, you know. Um, and then he kind of has his like uh, return to form, you know, where he shaves his beard and everything. So I think it's cool right. that like he almost was worthy in Avengers 2 and then, you know, had to go through and figure himself out and then finally was able to wield it you know like that's super cool like you can look at that whole thing and be like that's so sick but um when i when i look at like the master sword i i i start to wonder how this limits the story because you know nobody is trying to find it like that's something that's weird to me that i that i thought about i'm like in every zelda game you get the master sword, but it's not like there are people looking for it. It's not like there's other people that want to find it because it's this legendary artifact weapon that could, you know, give them all of this power. Maybe it's not even that powerful to the average person. It's only powerful against Ganon. Like, I don't know. Maybe if you don't have the Triforce, it can't do anything special. I, I don't know. Like, like they, I don't know if they established this stuff. And that's one of the flaws of Zelda is that they, they don't really go in depth on this stuff. So... Um, but then, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, I think that the Zelda series is kind of limited in a way. Like they're limiting themselves by saying that Link is the only person who can use this. Because if there was a Zelda game that came out and the plot for the game revolved around you going to get the Master Sword and uh-oh, it's not there because someone else got here first and took it. Like, that'd be crazy. Wouldn't that be a crazy that be story? Crazy. You know? But it's like, how have we gotten this many games without that being a thing, you know, without anyone trying to take it or, you know, keep you from getting it or whatever. It's like, you just always have it. Link just always gets it. Uh, and, you know, the most interesting, I think, thing they did with it, uh, maybe besides it breaking Tears of the Kingdom, which is a whole other thing, because whether or not that was a good story element is a whole other debate. But uh, in Wind Waker, when you find the Master Sword, it's like, you have to like actually work to reawaken it because it's like, Something happened to it. Um, that's like the most they've done with it, pretty much. So I don't know. I I do think that I almost think yeah. Throughout time and history, Ganondorf when he reincarnates, he keeps a lot of his memories. Well, he never um, that that I mean, this is getting into Zelda lore, but like, Ganondorf never died. Uh, at least I, I I'm trying to think about what you're talking about because the Ganondorf in Ocarina of Time. Uh, he doesn't reincarnate because he never died. So the one in Wind Waker is the same one that's on Ocarina of Time, and the one that's in Twilight Princess is also the same one from Ocarina of Time because those are two different timelines. Um, and it's at it's at the end of those so, both respective games that they get that they like quote unquote die. You would think so. that if time and time again Ganondorf loses to the Master Sword, at some point he would be like, "Hey, if I just got rid of the Master Sword." <laughs> <laughs> problem solved yeah and that's why it's so weird because in tears of the kingdom he's like like you think that blade would do anything to me and he like breaks it and it's like that okay well that doesn't even make sense like how the crap did he was he able to break this like why didn't you if do it? it breaks so easily why hasn't he done it before? yeah i'm like why have you broken it before bro like i don't know it's it's weird and it's it's proving that like you know zora or uh, not zora zelda has a bunch of uh really cool story things and actually i think character development is probably where zelda shines the most uh but when it comes to long form storytelling and lore uh the, the zelda does not really it, it's not very good at that um they, they kind of staple together games to kind of make sense uh and they the more you think about it the more it doesn't make sense but i, I just thought that was interesting because it, it is mess sword is one of the most iconic ones and i do think that that is a limiting factor that they really only let link interact with it at all even though it's most of the time just sitting in the woods um yeah like anybody could go and find it but apparently not because i, I mean and maybe you know i i'm sure that zelda fans like super hardcore zelda fans might hop in the comments and correct me on this because i i do know in like twilight princess that like and in other games probably like there are guardians of the forest that like keep people from getting to it. Like they like shift the forest around and like you get lost sure. in the lost woods to like keep you from getting just the master sword. Maybe, maybe that's only in Twilight Princess, but I, there might be lore around why nobody else finds it. But um, I just think it's interesting. I, I think it's really, I think it's really interesting. 
Um, but back to back to legendary items um, and storytelling. Uh, I'm going to throw in this fourth form that legendary items can take, and I'm going to call it. What were the other three? So, all right, I have weapons, ancient relics and artifacts, and gained superpowers. Oh, okay, gotcha. And the, then the fourth one. The fourth one, I'm going to call the chosen one. Oh. Um, so, I think that in terms of storytelling, it's also very similar where the character themselves is the legendary item. And okay. what, I, what I mean by that is like the dragonborn or the avatar, right? Like, like from last airbender, like these, these characters are the legendary weapon. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, okay. Like they were born with it as it, like Superman even could fall into this category, even though he's normal on his planet, but like on earth, he is just a God, you know? So right, right. I think that uh, in this way, it could also serve that purpose. Um, whereas gained superpowers is something like Iron Man or Spider-Man or something where like they didn't have it and they either had to work for it or it just happened to them. Um, like they stumbled upon it. Whereas this is like they, it is them, you know? So I, I, uh, I do think that there are some stories as well that incorporate this with it where it's like, you are the chosen one. Therefore, you get the legendary weapon. You know what I mean? Like, okay. like sometimes, yeah, sometimes, sometimes they're also paired up, is what I'm trying to say. But I did think that this was another form it could take, because like in uh, Skyrim, like you're the guy. You know what I mean? No one else can take down the dragons and all that stuff. It's, right. it's you. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 what do you think that does to a story? Do you think that limits it? Do you think it's, how does it differ from the other forms, do you think? Or is it the same? So I think it does differ. And it from what you're saying in all of these different modes, these four different forms, as you forms, right? You yes. take different forms. Yes. Uh I do feel that they uh they differ and it matters which character you attach what item to so a chosen one a, a great example that you mentioned was the avatar um being having that chosen one kind of thing for him mm -hmm. is so compelling because you're given these essentially you're the best bender in existence right you you are the only one that can master and or learn all the other elements however that works i didn't right. i'm not sure if there's like a bloodline rule on yeah that's how, it, that's how it seemed to be it seemed to be one of those like because i mean even in zelda and in other forms of media there's always like every thousand years this kind of person is born you know right so just one of those like well oh, he's the guy <laughs> yeah like, well so he has these yeah uh, I guess so. In the, in this case, the avatar has all these special abilities that no one else can have, right? And they're kind of put up to be almost like a godlike figure. They they can also access previous avatar rendition memories, right? And gain understanding from thousands and thousands of years of humanity. Yes. But with that, you're also so like. I think the nice duality of being the Avatar is you do have all these special abilities. You're amazing. But you're also considered either like the most wisest, most sacred person on the planet, or you're considered the biggest threat. So mm -hmm. the whole world looks to Aang uh, as the Avatar be this like savior, basically, for the world. Mm hmm Whereas the Fire Nation sees him as the world's biggest threat. Mm -hmm. And so he's either worshipped or he's hated. And right. That, okay. That kind of mantle has to come with that power. So in this case, oh, uh, in, in this exact kind of situation, Anakin Skywalker mm, uh, he ends up making yes. the wrong choice, as we all know. 
Well, He's quote, also quote, quote unquote. I mean, to... honestly, a world without Darth Vader is a sad world. So I think he made the right. That's choice. true. But <laughs> and there's <laughs> actually a lot of people that <laughs> a lot of people that do feel the Empire was right, even though they did wrong things, they were still kind of right. Anyway. Like a uh, like a Thanos situation where it's like he was just yeah, he was just yeah. bringing balance to the force, like they said. Right. <laughs> so uh, with with Anakin being the chosen one, there's so much that he can do. He's the strongest force user. I I do not care whatsoever about anyone else in the Star Wars universe. Anakin Skywalker is supposed to be the best force user. Ray. What's her name? Ray. Ray. Not, it's Legends? not Skywalker. Ray. Yeah. Whatever her name is. <laughs> I forget her last name. She's, too. she's this magical force user. Actually, this goes right into what, the point I'm going to make with the chosen okay. one. Okay. Okay. Um, Anakin is super powerful. And because of that, he. Well, because I guess because he's the chosen one, or considered the chosen one by how many midichlorians or whatever he has in his body, he's super force sensitive. But there is also that exact same situation where this is enormous mantle put on him, and he's targeted by Palpatine. B, he tries to Palpatine targets him as like the next best power that he could. Have. And the Jedi Council has a keen eye on him to keep him in check, to make sure that he is a force for good. Even though the Chosen One, by legend, is supposed to bring balance to the Force, both sides are really wanting the Chosen One to bring the balance in their favor, which is so interesting. Mm, um, how does that work? Like that's, yeah. that, 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 It's contradictory. Like You can't have balance in your favor you know what i mean like but that does introduce the engine of conflict into the the star wars plot car on the, the analogy train the plot uh x-wing <laughs> yeah the plot x-wing car <laughs> whatever it's, a, it's an x-wing but, with so wheels like <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh it's the x-wheel the right. X-Wheel, so, yes. With that being said, you can you, if you have the right way to write the abilities, whereas being like being strong with a force or having that kind of power or with Superman kind of being sort of the chosen one for Earth, you have to attach the right amount of responsibility and mantle to the character that makes it believable. That with such insane strength and power also comes so much responsibility and um, just pressure to, to be able to use those effectively in a good way. And some characters fail, and some characters do good. Um, but if you try and make a character the chosen one without properly identifying that they're kind of the chosen one or a chosen one or something like that. Yeah. Then you get things like Ray Skywalker. Um. Yeah. Uh huh. Like she definitely her her, her arc doesn't those feel characters as, as clear. It doesn't is essentially feel, doesn't feel as good as the other ones for sure. It's just a recipe for plot armor. The yeah. chosen one done wrong is plot armor. In a way, in a way, yes, because like there's plenty of movies that don't have chosen ones that are. That there's plot armor. That's not plot armor. But... Like, if you do the chosen one arc wrong, it then just becomes. Plot yes, armor. I I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, yeah, this is very interesting. I actually, you had a lot of great stuff to say about that. Uh, that that was awesome. I, I'm learning that, I think the the difference between the chosen one and like having, like an item, is that, it's like if the item was human right and yeah yeah it that's on paper yeah that's what it is but it's like you, you add a bunch of human elements to the the story of it so instead of it just being like oh everyone's trying to get the genie in the lamp because they want the wishes it's like well what if well and actually that's actually not the the best example because the genie is a guy um 
Because like that's actually well, a point in, in Aladdin where the genie is like, bro, I have feelings and wants too. And Aladdin's a homie and is like, bro, I, I want you to be happy too. Because like when you're bringing all this up, it's like you have Aang who is seen as by most of the world as an object, right? Not as a person. And there's plenty of other uh, instances of this happening where the the chosen one or the person that has these like crazy abilities uh they're seen as more of like a weapon or they're seen as like just a tool right not as an actual human where as they are so it like adds that deeper layer to it where it's like well what do they think you know what does anakin want it doesn't matter what the other two want like what is what does ang want to do like he just wants to live like a normal life or probably you know what i mean or whatever whatever right. it is right it's like what do they want even though like the rest of the world wants to them wants to use them for their benefit you know so it's it's that's actually very interesting instead of it just being like this like magical like stone that can like you know give you eternal life it's like the stone actually has its own wants and things too so i do think that well, maybe it is better to have a chosen one if it's done right uh, than a legendary item because you can add that whole human layer and add that extra layer of storytelling and character development and interaction. Uh, there might be some some pros there that you wouldn't gain otherwise. So I wouldn't necessarily count legendary items out of the running quite yet. I, I just had this thought where... Okay, okay. You can... Well, you, something you brought up really struck me about how the chosen one kind of arc feels very objectifying or the factions within the story objectify the chosen one yes and yes the audience just wants to know what the chosen one wants uh -huh. well if you have a legendary item specifically oftentimes a weapon it's you can if you ha give it human elements to it it's almost like the flip so Mjolnir, going back to Mjolnir, is the best example I can think of. Mjolnir does follow strict rules to kind of yes. who, who gets to wield it or not. Yep. But it, it does... It's interesting that it still chooses Thor. Like, it allows Thor to use it, essentially. Yeah. It gives, it, yeah. it gives Thor the permission to wield it. And as time goes by, they learn to trust each other more, it feels like. Or Mjolnir becomes more responsive, and Thor is more uh, proficient with Mjolnir. Yeah. And, you um, know, and say what you will about the new Thor movie, but that was a huge plot element of that movie was kind of like him trying to earn the trust back for his old hammer, you know? Right. Um, or another interesting item, which I do kind of believe is a legendary item in some way, is Sokka's boomerang. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, can you elaborate? <laughs> so, yeah. Sokka's boomerang is a very important item in the story. I guess this comes back to what makes it a legendary item. Because the Sword of the Stone doesn't have any inherent powers. It just was the, the mantle that's carried with the sword. Is yeah, what makes like, it a legendary like sword. What, what it means, and you know, and maybe that's what it was in, because there are plenty of fictional stories that make Excalibur actually like this insane magical item. Um, sure, and there are some even mythological, like ancient renditions of Excalibur that do hold some sort of magical powers. Right, but a legendary item could also be, I think. There's something that really influences the story. Interesting. In okay. in a good way. Not something that you have to find like a MacGuffin. Because you can definitely run into MacGuffin problems mm -hmm. where it's just like something they have to get to progress. Yeah, but we, we should do an episode something on something like the honestly. Yeah, we should. <laughs> There's the golden apple that in in Greek mythology. Okay. It's used I don't even know I don't think it has any kind of magical powers. It's just the mad the golden apple is given to a dude i forget his name and he has to choose between some woman and aphrodite and athena between the three and whoever he gives the apple to is considered the 
most beautiful or something like that. Ah, okay. And in that story, the golden apple itself doesn't really do anything specific other than it's a freaky golden apple. Interesting. And that's it. But the the weight it has on the consequences of what it represents in the story matter. So in this case, with Sokka's boomerang, not only is it given semi-human elements with the way Sokka treats it, he cherishes it, he shines it often, he trusts in it. Later in in the show, you can see when he throws it at the beginning of the show, he, he kind of expects it to come back, but not in any meaningful way, yeah. right? Uh -huh. Later on, he'll throw it knowing it's going to come back to him. Uh -huh. And he'll he'll play it off and be like kind of distracting someone till the boomerang comes back and saves him. Yeah. And in that way, it gives us almost human-esque relationship, this bond of trust between character and item that is significant to the viewer. Now, okay, so I see what you're saying. I don't know if that makes it a legendary item or if there's another term for that where it's like an item that's important to a character versus I like an iconic item yeah okay i see what you're saying it does check a lot of the boxes but i'm also wondering if in order to be a legendary item i feel like it needs to be a desirable item for like everybody like something that everybody wants you know like or would want. Yeah, like all of these other items I, I'm seeing are things where it's like, you know, even if you can't wield Thor's hammer, but it's like, if I could, if only I could, right? Like, that's something you, you think that about. That kind of power. But it's like, does anybody look at Sokka's boomerang and say, but if only I could do that? You know, I don't know. I, I do don't know. <laughs> sort of hold the theory that somehow it always comes back, no matter what. Well, it's sure, pretty magical. sure. But it's not, it's like, if you're an earthbender, why do you need a boomerang? You know what I mean? Like, that, that's Unless you make an earth boomerang. Well, yeah, but I, I feel like that's that's where I kind of disagree. But I do agree okay. with the importance of it, you know? And I do think that that is important for it to be a legendary item. But I'm like, it, it's not on the same caliber. Like, everybody wants the Dragon Balls. Everybody wants the Genie and the Lamp. Everybody wants, uh, like, the Holy Grail, you know? Like, that's something that you know, I don't think anybody would turn down unless they are just like a very humble person that doesn't want things out of life, I guess. Like they, they don't want, like maybe there's, they're already like, they're like a monk and they're like, you know, you know, I, you gotta, content. I, I don't, yeah, I don't need this to be happy kind of a thing. Uh, like, or eternal life would actually, actually bring me unhappiness or whatever it is. In that but, vein, uh, Another interesting chosen one example is Liu Kang from the new Mortal Kombat games. Mm. The, recently, the 11 and 1. Yes. So, quick spoilers for it. I won't take too long. But Liu Kang essentially becomes the god of time. Uh, but when you mention Monk, you maybe think of him because he's a Shaolin monk. Yes. So he's he's very... He has nothing of wanting. He He just doesn't interesting seek those kind of things yes so actually when he becomes the god of time and he restarts history to create a new era he voluntarily gives up the power to manipulate events over time so he he sets a couple things in motion just so that like the massacres that he lived through don't happen um yeah. so like the villains aren't able to do what they did in previous timelines but once he sets that up he he leaves it he's gets rid of that power and kind of says everyone is free to craft their own destiny i don't wow. i don't want to hold that kind of power and that's an interesting thing for a chosen one to do where he goes from chosen one to voluntarily being um the uh he's still a god or at least a demigod in power level but he like actively chooses not to be the chosen one. Yeah. Wait. Okay. This is actually really cool. Is what does it mean? Because this is what this is what you're telling me with that. Because that's really cool. What does it mean when someone with like so the legendary item right or the chosen one right? Because we've established that these are all kind of similar. When you decide after using it to put it away, right? Like I feel like that has a big story 
implication, right? Like, right. That's a really cool story thing, and it's a really cool, cool like character moment and growth um, for them to do that. The thing that comes to my mind, this is huge spoilers for Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, go watch it, please. Don't don't listen to me. Um, uh, but it, at the end of the show. Uh, like, cause the whole show is about equivalent exchange and all that stuff. But like at the end of the show, yeah. the answer to getting his brother back is to actually give up his ability to do alchemy. Like he's giving up his superpower, his legendary item. He's giving up his legendary item. He's putting it away uh, so that he can get his brother back. It's really cool. The whole show is kind of about that, where it's like, like what is life worth living? And like what is worth what and uh just kind of like that whole like mind game like that like I, like the whole story you never once think that that could be the answer you know what i mean like n nobody ever thinks right. that that could be the answer but then when it happens you're like that makes total sense you know like oh my gosh what a, what a good what a good show but uh you know just i mean you can even think of ocarina of time i mean i know we said ocarina of time wasn't the best example but uh in a lot of ways at the end of the game link goes back and he puts the master sword away he's like uh i, I did it did its job you know i'm i'm done so yeah it's super it's a very hero defining moment yeah that's that's super cool i i that's actually a great way to kind of wrap this episode up you know uh do you have any other thoughts on uh legendary items or any stories you wanted to touch on before we end well, I always like to just kind of reflect, stare at the reflection of the front of the train <laughs> as it's coming at me at a balloon speed. Um, and just kind of recognize what did I learn through this and take, take real notes for the future. Yeah. I think there are many different forms legendary items can take. And it's so important to attach the right one to your character for what they need. Yes. Like the character. Is just the character that interacts with it is like just as important as the item itself, and it's almost like you know, like movies where like two characters bounce off each other. Uh, yeah, the the item is almost like that, where like you need the item and the character to bounce off each other and and kind of like improve each other. But then, like, you also need to recognize that like their time together, just like any other relationship in life, has an end. So. I don't know, like, maybe we shouldn't be treating items like items. We should be treating them like their own character when we write a story. We should treat, you know, and, like, it is cool, like, with Sokka's Boomerang and with Mjolnir, like, these these w items that actually have personalities given to them. Like, I think that's actually the way you should look at it. Like, the you need to write your it the legendary items into the story as if they were their own character. Um, I think that's that's what I'm learning from this. Um, and yeah, they don't have to be a weapon. <laughs> but sometimes weapons are people. A lot. Sometimes weapons are sometimes people. Sometimes weapons are people. Hashtag Soul Eater. Hashtag Xenoblade. You know, sometimes weapons are people. I yeah. don't know why Aladdin never just took the lamp and bonked <laughs> Jafar on the head with it. Yeah, he should have just wished. <laughs> he should. His first wish should have just been to get rid of Jafar, bro. Come on. Or again, like. The lamp itself looks pretty hefty, and it's it's definitely metal. You could swing that thing. <laughs> yeah, but Jafar's got like weird magic stuff. I don't know. Sure, that's true. <laughs> He's got a bird. I just that's such a funny. Well, they swing the bird. Uh, yeah, either way, it's just a funny <laughs> image to me. Is Aladdin just like Bob. for my first wish and just clocks Jafar in the face with a lamp? Yeah, dude, I love Aladdin. Go watch Aladdin, guys, if you haven't. Also, go watch Full Metal Alchemist. Uh, if you've already seen it, go watch it again. I'm going to go watch it again. It's a good show. <laughs> it's a good show. <laughs> it's really deep. Good uh, skip the second episode. It's it's horrible and sad. No, you need the sadness. Without the tragedy, you don't have you don't have their their reasoning. It's too tragic. <laughs> you need to understand the tragedy. You need to understand why they do what they do, because that's that's what defines why they do what they do. Is all of the terrible stuff they go through in the beginning. So, it is terrible though. Maybe if you've seen it before, you can skip it. But, anyways, that's that's been Story Dive. Uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, I this was a really great 
topic, I think. It's really interesting, honestly. That's why I wanted to do it. Like, I Yeah. Shout out to uh, my friend Caden. He's the one that kind of yeah, pitched thanks. this idea to me and it made it in. Yeah, the it, t- it turned into a real episode. This was a this was a great topic. So Hopefully if, your dreams have come true and yeah. some doubloons for you. Yeah, some doubloons for you, man. I'm gonna give you at least one. So good job, bro. Uh, congrats all around. Um, if, you, if you guys listening have any other topics that you want us to talk about, please put them in the comments below or just anywhere, anywhere where we can see them. Uh, and we might do an episode on it. So thanks so much for watching. Uh, this has been Story Dive. Like, like, follow, subscribe, all that stuff. Uh, any final remarks, Kai? Nope. Just be sure to give us a follow. We appreciate all of the attention. Tell your friends about this. Uh, we we really want to expand the story sphere. Add some some community carts to the train. Feed you some good episodes. So yeah, yeah like- just share it with your friends, and we appreciate all the support thus far. Yeah, uh, me too. Anyways, that's that's been the episode. See you later, guys. Bye bye. The story continues next time.